Our next speaker is Ted Mendoza. Ted is the Capital Projects Manager at UMass Amherst, where he manages design and construction of projects on the UMass campus aimed at reducing energy emissions. He also serves on the Chancellor's Sustainability Advisory Committee, which aims to facilitate integration of sustainability initiatives across the campus, recommends sustainability priorities to the Chancellor and the Leadership Council. He is an engineer by training and has 25 years of experience in all matters related to energy, solar voltaics, hot water systems, energy efficiencies and auditing, and energy management in buildings. Ted, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. So, before I start, I just want to mention, Julie, you, you um, purchased solar panels. Um, when we first moved to Amherst uh, 10 years ago, we had an oil boiler. And, after, and I come from the West Coast originally, and so I'm not used to thousands of dollars of heating bills. And so that really freaked me out. Oh, I'm sorry. And so that kind of, that kind of you know, surprised me. And I ended up, we ended up replacing our oil boiler with a wood pellet boiler. This was nine years ago, and what we ended up doing is getting folks for an oil boiler replacement, a propane gas replacement, and a wood pellet oil replacement. And with the incentives at the time, nine years ago, the wood pellet was cheaper than the other two. It was crazy. And now, nine years later, we're still paying the same price per ton for wood pellets. And I know that we see in, in the news, oil and gas prices are going crazy. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's just sometimes just being at the, the right time in the right place for certain decisions. So anyways, um, I'm here. here today to talk about um, carbon the carbon mitigation concept, um, as well as some key considerations of uh, how to take action now. Okay. So what does carbon mitigation mean? Um, in current conversations, you know, this term can mean several different, to take on several different forms. So carbon mitigation or carbon neutrality, carbon zero, decarbonization, net zero, net zero carbon. You may hear about all these different terms. And you know, not all sustainability terms are equal, but since the conversations around this topic are still very young, generally we're talking about the same thing, which is moving away from anything that uses or burns fossil fuels into some kind of usable energy, such as natural propane gas or heating oil, and there's also a concept of moving towards increasing the electrification of our homes and businesses by use of either on-site renewable energy, if possible, um, and by working with our local utilities to encourage them to procure their energy from renewable sources. And so what kinds of renewable energy sources are there? Well, you know, you can imagine, I, I imagine you're already familiar with the large solar arrays that, are, that continue to grow and populate our area and beyond. And maybe even some of you have, um, have actively established these arrays on your properties. Um, other renewable ener uh, energy sources you may be familiar with include wood, wood pellets I just mentioned, or other biofuels, and then there's the wind farms, and even hydro energy, which was used more prevalently here uh, back several, you know, many decades ago when um, textile mills were active and um, a source of the local economy. Um, but today I want to talk about a specific renewable energy source that I think has great potential here in Hadley and one that kind of exists right underneath our feet. And I'm talking about geothermal energy. 
So geothermal um, or ground source heating and cooling is this concept that leverages the solid bedrock um, of the earth beneath us, usually several hundred feet below grade, um, as either a heat sink or a heat source, depending on what's needed. And you know there are other piping arrangements like um, the horizontal loop or the slinky loop shown here in this graphic, um, or other heat sink sources um, that can be used, such as ponds or lake beds, um, or even above ground or below ground thermal energy storage tanks, as you can see here as well. Um, these other options may make some better sense depending on the makeup of your property and surroundings. Um, but generally, in the New England region, you know, the best approach or the approach we take is earth-based and kind of deep vertical ores. And the underlying foundation of why this works is that the bedrock, several hundred feet below grade, is this gigantic thermal mass, right, that doesn't fluctuate with the climate changes we experience here on the surface level. And so science tells us that um, the temperature at that depth stays relatively the same, roughly about 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, regardless of what we uh, either put in or take out, right? And so leveraging that knowledge, we're able to store and extract energy just using you know, the typical laws of nature. So at UMass just yesterday, we formally announced our intentions to transform our campus to one that's run by 100% renewable energy within the next decade. <laughs> and this, this vision addresses, this vision to address the university's contribution to climate crisis aims to position us as this role model in the Commonwealth and for other large research universities to learn from as they embark upon their own energy transitions. And so, as a state-owned facility, UMass is subjected to the recent um, executive orders issued by the Commonwealth. It's also similar at the federal level to transform all state and federal agencies to carbon neutral running facilities by around 2050. Um, our vision looks to accomplish that about 15 to 18 years ahead of that. And how are we doing this? Among other things, a key component is by the establishment of these geothermal energy storage systems throughout our campus over the next several years. So, taking this ambitious vision, ambitious vision from our you know, neighbors up the hill up there, now we take it back to Hadley. Imagine, right, now gone are these ideas of this renewable energy as this vision of just large solar fields and windmills peppering you know, our vast farmlands and communities, which I understand is sometimes a uh, point of debate. But imagine now, if you will, as you're evaluating your own properties, open areas, or making plans uh, to till the earth, readying for the next agricultural wave, uh, you know, you're able to affordably, affordably establish geothermal wells deep below, right? Low enough so that it isn't affected by the normal working of the land, but is available to store and extract energy in perpetuity, really, to heat and now possibly even cool your home, right? If that type of abundant energy storage is available to you, I mean, wouldn't you consider using it? I know I, you know, I would. So, <clears throat> You know, isn't this complicated though, right? Isn't this complicated? How do you do this kind of thing, right? The photos on the left are recent. This is mid-May, oh sorry, mid-March from this year. This during spring break for uh, UMass. And this is our um, first, establish the establishment of our first geothermal well, right? For this carbon zero project that we're undertaking. And you see here, really, you know, the equipment is completely mobile, right? It doesn't make too much of a mess, right? It's kind of contained. And it's not, not really any different than any drilling equipment used for the setting of new water wells for homes or businesses, right? Or buildings that just aren't close enough to access the local shared municipal utilities, right? So for a typical Hadley home, maybe two or six wells, two to six wells may be sufficient. It just depends on the size and the need, but 
you know, it also depends on how deep you go. So you, maybe you can just get away with one as well, right? So now imagine, right, you've done this. You've incorporated this technology in your home and business. And now you expand your well site to more of your open land, right? This extra capacity now could be shared with your neighbors, starting to bring communities together, distributing and diffusing our reliance on fossil fuels, and now maybe even thinking about developing into a town-wide or a district-wide underground energy system, right? One that shares the energy between its inhabitants and empowers everyone to take ownership of their own future human existence, right? This existence not reliant on the need for fossil fuels of any kind, right? So if anything, I think the vision of this is, is worth thinking about now. And so, in closing, I just want to point out a few key actions to consider. You know, creating a strategy for your own assets towards migrating away from fossil fuels, you know, it's something that really can be done now. Since these are not really currently widespread ideas with many local resources readily available, you know, the reality is the price points to accomplish this work may be volatile for the time being, until at least the market's supply-demand dynamics settle over time, right, into some kind of equilibrium. So, you know, do some exploration, right? Maybe get some quotes, work with your neighbors, create these support communities, sharing resources, maybe even procuring equipment, right, and thinking about starting up new businesses in the industry, right? Locate and take advantage of these incentives or whatever incentives are available and really in general just try to help build up this demand because this I think right now is the challenge right this is our opportunity that we have before us is to kind of create this and we know we can do this right we see it with solar panels recently we see how things change when people want them right so as you're developing your own strategy you know I want you to think big right think beyond the you know, some economic standard that, of justification that would have worked, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You know, it doesn't work for the current time or the foreseeable future, right? Our, our, our reasoning is different now, right? You know, our values are different. They're starting to change. And realize that, you know, it's likely that the volatility in the utility costs will only increase as access to oil and gas decreases over time. I mean, right, I think we all can agree that it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse, only going to get more expensive. So, you know, from my perspective, you know, and I've been working in the design and construction industry for all my life, 30 years, and I see that these tools and technologies, right, the, the ones needed to make these kinds of transitions possible, they're here, they're available to us right now, right? That's pipes, it's concrete, grouting, it's drilling equipment, right? These are long-standing things, right? They're read readily available things. So imagining this movement towards a fossil fuel-free world of the next century, is, it's not, I mean, it's not only possible, but it starts with the choices and the opportunities we make, you know, and the groundwork that we're laying before us, really, right now. So, Thanks for your time, and I hope that gives you something to think about.